Welcome to Behavioral Health Today, a podcast brought to you by the Triad Network. This podcast is designed to share trending topics occurring within the world and our communities and bring them a behavioral and mental health perspective. Welcome to Behavioral Health Today, a Triad production. I'm your host, Dr. Graham Taylor. My guest today is Karen Chung. Karen has 12 years of experience in the field of behavioral analysis and is the CEO and founder of Special Learning Incorporated, an education technology company that delivers web-based training, virtual supervision, and consultation for BCBAs anywhere in the world. Aside from her work with Special Learning, Karen has been at work building the Ethical Standards Board, an online database of certified ABAs and registered behavioral technicians available for the general public to find qualified clinicians and agencies. Today, we're talking in our podcast about the behavioral analysis industry and the Ethics Standard Board. Karen, welcome to the show. Thanks, Graham. Happy to be here. It is nice to have you back. As we were talking at the beginning of the show, you and I have been talking for a number of years together about various right. things, and but the field in general, and it's so nice to finally have you on our show. Hey, you know, as we start out today, give our listeners kind of an idea. What brought you into this field of behavioral analysis in this behavioral science area and the creation that came out of that of the Special Learning Incorporated? It's interesting, actually, when you talk to people in the field of behavior analysis, and then you ask them the question, of, well, what led you into the field? Uh-huh. Generally, what you're going to hear is, well, it's kind of happenstance. I accidentally stumbled my way into this field. And the same with me. My background is in corporate. So I'm a CPA by training. And I spent many, you know, first 15, 20 years of my life in corporate. And I happened to be working at a consulting assignment for a company called Brainy Baby. And they have early childhood development, DVDs and books and such. We were looking for a market expansion and Dennis Vidoric, who's the CEO, happened to mention, hey, listen, over the years, I've gotten a lot of unsolicited testimonials from parents of kids with autism saying, our product is amazing. You know, it taught my child how to talk, you know, build language skills. So he said, well, why don't you go attend a autism conference? And let's see if there's an opportunity for us to develop a specialty practice. So that led me to my first autism conference in St. Charles back 12 mm-hmm. years ago. And... Graham, it's kind of funny because, you know, I come from corporate. So when you typically attend like a trade show, industry trade show, it's really nicely set up and it's really organized. Autism Conference is a parent organization, parent advocacy organization. And my first impression was, oh my gosh, this is like a disorganized, chaotic mess. But back then, the field of autism was very, very grassroots. So Mm -hmm. I was walking around, happened to meet a couple of behavior analysts, board certified behavior analysts and had a conversation with them. And one of them was kind enough to let me down and explain to me about autism as a condition, because prior to this, I didn't have any background in education Mm. or healthcare. I just heard of autism, but didn't really even understand what that meant. And then she started to talk about this intervention called applied behavior analysis. And I remember listening and thinking, oh my gosh, there's this almost like this magical intervention that if applied properly, and allow kids to achieve 50% success in being able to mainstream, regardless of where they fall on the spectrum. And I thought, this is amazing. That's pretty exciting. Crazy, right? You know, when you think about developmental challenges that people experience and the interventions, I don't know of any other intervention with that level of success. And Mm -hmm. it's been replicated many, many times. But the problem that I saw that the field was experiencing was that we didn't have enough behavior analysts to provide the intervention. So back 12 years ago, there were only 16,200 behavior analysts in the world. Can Mm -hmm. you imagine? People with autism, you're talking about hundreds of millions of people, and you have 16,200 professionals that are able to provide this. And the more I learned about applied behavior analysis and learned, really, this isn't something that you need to go to medical school for. Mm -hmm. You know, there are obviously, when you're a behavior analyst, you're experts in behavior capable of doing very sophisticated intervention, but there's some basic intervention that you can teach anybody, parents to do, siblings, you know, babysitters. So my thought was, there's this amazing opportunity to bring Mm -hmm. this technology to the world. And me putting on the business, you know, person's hat thought, okay, well, we have technology that can allow us to access, you know, people, no matter where they're located, as long as there's a broadband connection. And so that got me into the field of applied behavior analysis back 12 years ago. And really just kind of thinking about 
it wasn't fair that mm. this amazing technology existed, but it was only available to such a small group of people. And if there were elements of this that we can take and use training as a platform to teach other people to do that and literally bring applied behavior analysis to the world, the amount of impact that was going to, you know, touch the lives of hundreds of millions of people. So that's Absolutely. been the mission of you know, special learning ever since. You know, when you talk about the need in this area, it is immense worldwide. I, I, we're just, I think, beginning to fully appreciate that part of what you're sharing right now. Part of, I think, what all of our talks have been about as we've talked kind of offline and over, over the years about the the significant need in this area. When, when we're talking about this area, let's, let's define it just a wee bit more. You're starting already to do it. But when we talk about this field of behavioral analysis in terms of diagnostic, you know, kind of a patient base that people are working with, some of the treatments that are being done in the history of this industry. And then we'll go a little bit further in just a moment, but give us a little bit of a background. So you're a psychologist, you understand principles of behavior and applied behavior analysis is it's a science. So it's a methodology or an intervention. So it's not a drug kind of methodology and probably do not even talk therapy as well. It's a very disciplined way of manipulating environments. Yes. And using positive reinforcement, sometimes negative reinforcement, which is a punishment procedure, you know, but sometimes punishment as well, to change people's behavior. And so there's two different things that the power of applied behavior analysis and the way I think about this. One is when you have somebody with autism, with an autism diagnosis, what you're dealing with are a bunch of deficits, right? So you have somebody that typically has behavior issues, and then you have a bunch of skills deficits. So they might have sensory related issues, but they might not have language. And so the power of applied behavior analysis is I don't know of any other intervention that's as powerful as ABA in mm -hmm. managing behavior. And that's incredibly important because obviously, unless you're able to manage that behavior and how do you ever get a person to be in a state of learning? Mm -hmm. So the other side of applied behavior analysis is in skill acquisition. Mm -hmm. And you know, you think about people with autism, it's not that they don't have that cognitive ability. They're just different, right? They have a different way of learning. And right. so the traditional way of teaching isn't going to be effective. So when you think about applied behavior analysis, a very simple way to look at it is it's just a different way of teaching. We have this intervention that can provide them, you know, the, the repetition and the intensity that's necessary to allow them to like, close the gap. So the science of applied behavior analysis is, you know, it's really only been around for about 30, 35 years. It's a very, very young field. That's why we have such few clinicians. And as an industry, we haven't done a really great job of marketing this as a profession. So when you talk to a behavior analyst and you ask you know, questions about, well, how did you get into the field? Especially the older ones, you know, they'll say things like, oh, well, you know, I was a babysitter. And mm -hmm. I, you know, the child that I was babysitting was, had special needs. They had autism and he was receiving services from mm -hmm. board certified behavior analyst. And I learned about the power of applied yeah. behavior analysis and I fell in love with it. That's very, very common when you talk to people in our field and we'll say, we fell in love with the technology. Exactly. The power of the technology and its ability to help people achieve a level of independence. I like that what you're saying right here. Most behavior analysts kind of fall in love with us. The, mo the ones that I've spoken with, absolutely fell in love with it from what they saw or witnessed. And we're kind of amazed that, you know, here are these skill deficits kind of on with those on the autistic spectrum. And they use as positive reinforcement, these yeah. skill acquisition techniques and trainings. It's nothing negative. It's, it's all positive trying to shape. And uh, exactly. well, what you said, it was a really good point. It's, it's building upon their strengths to shape additional mm -hmm. skills, acquisition of, you know, uh, different areas of deficit and to watch the transformation and then to watch these kids be able to integrate the way you're saying mm -hmm. is such a hopeful, hopeful thing. You know, we're talking and we're using some terms here, behavior analysts, registered behavioral technicians, break down for us who is in this field professionally. The experts are what we call their, you know, a certified, right, board certified behavior analysts. And there's an organization that governs the field of applied behavior analysis, and it's called the Behavior Analyst Certification Board. And so BCBAs, there are three different levels of board certified behavior analysts. So typically about 80% of BCBAs, the acronym, there's lots of acronyms in our field, yeah. are they have a master's degree. And so it's okay. a master's degree level. And then there are about 5% of BCBAs, 10%. They're at the PhD level. 
And so yeah. they're called BCBAD, so Board Certified Behavior Analyst dash the doctoral. So, and, that, and then there's a third level, which is BCABA, Board Certified Consistent Behavior Analyst. And those are at the bachelor's level. That credential is being phased out kind of slowly, unfortunately, because our field is completely driven by reimbursements. Mm -hmm. You know, in our field, it's two tiered service delivery model, which is you have the behavior analysts that are experts that are doing the assessment, developing the treatment plan, and then the registered behavior technicians or behavior technicians are the ones that are implementing. And in our field right now, you know, it's a newly created credential that was only created in 2014. The field has grown very, very quickly. And we have about 120,000 registered behavior technicians in the field, which looks really, it sounds really great. sounds really impressive. We've been able to ramp up very quickly. But given the demand for ABA services, which is primarily has been coming from availability of funding, because parents have done an amazing job of lobbying the state to force insurance companies to provide reimbursement. Going back many, many years, there wasn't funding that was available for ABA services. The only funding that was available for ABA services was typically through the government, so Medicaid. And you know we had the Medicaid waiver program, which is wonderful that the service is out there. But what we were dealing with was parents you know, going on a wait list for years and years and years. So there's this funding mechanism that's available, but you know, we didn't have sufficient funds. So what parents were doing is they were paying for ABA services out of pocket. And applied behavior analysis is a very intensive intervention. So science will say you're going to get the best results with early intensive mm -hmm. intervention. And that means intensive means 35 hours a week. Yeah. Okay. So imagine paying for 35 hours worth of therapy at $50 an hour, an average ABA program, a full-time ABA program might cost anywhere between 50 to $75,000 a year. Mm -hmm. Parents were mortgaging their houses and they were going bankrupt because we didn't have funding that was available. And that was because the insurance companies would say, well, no, ABA is not a medical intervention. It's not a behavioral intervention. It's an educational intervention. And so parents bought that tooth and nail and state by state, they kept winning. Wow. And now we have insurance mandates in all 50 states, which is amazing, right? Because we have the availability of the funds. We don't have enough therapists. So 120,000 yeah. RBTs right now, I'm estimating we're probably about 100,000 short. It's the, that's the nature of the field. And that's what we're dealing with. It's this, you know, what I refer to as supply demand disconnect. And there's a lot of things that are happening in the field right now, you know, in terms of quality and the degradation of quality and private equity companies coming in because all of a sudden, wow, this became a multi-billion dollar industry. It might be a trillion dollar industry when you think about all of the availability of the monies that are out there. And so that leads to private equity agencies looking at this very grassroots industry growing very, very quickly where customer acquisition is never a problem anymore because you have parents on wait lists that are demanding services. Mm -hmm. So they have come into our field starting about 10 years ago. Karen, about if you wouldn't mind, I want to kind of highlight this piece right here because this is an area where you have particular concern. This is a this is a yeah. field that is young, yes. you know, relatively. And this is a group of professionals that is, you know, growing over time. Yeah. There's clearly a need and a demand for the services for these children. And there's increased funding beginning to occur. So there's some great momentum going. Yeah. But there's also a real concern that when there's money and when things are growing, mm -hmm. for certain directions to be taken, maybe even with large equity firms, et cetera, to come in. And this is where some of your concern and some of the challenges you're seeing in this field are emerging. And I want to get into the ethical standards board that you're also developing too. But tell us your concerns as this field grows and people come into it more and more and some services are starting, funding is there. There's an inherent concern in terms of the degradation of the treatment being provided and the treatment quality. Share with us those concerns, if you would. So when you think about people's motivation and, you know, generally prior to private equity coming into our field, the people that were starting ABA agencies and providing services, a lot of them were therapists, they were behavior analysts or clinicians, healthcare providers, or maybe they were parents, you know, who had kids on the spectrum 
were looking for services but couldn't find services. So they decided to start, you know, create their own business. So the inherent motivation of the individuals historically that founded our agencies were they wanted to help. They saw a need in the marketplace and they wanted to help. And so they created these ABA agencies. It wasn't about how much money can I make. It was about there's this really desperate need and there's this amazing intervention and we can help improve people's lives. And so that was the motivation of you know, the agencies that were started, the organizations. And you think about the nature and the motivation behind an equity-backed company, a private equity-backed company, is it's a business model, very, very successful business model. Private equity's business model is you go out there, create a fund, you raise money, lots and lots of money, hundreds of billions of dollars, and then now you have to deploy that money. So you take that money and you make acquisitions of businesses and you try to scale that up as quickly as possible. But the game is we're going to get in and we're going to get out. No. And so typically the exit that people are looking for, private equity backed companies, are it's five to seven years. So you take this grassroots industry that was filled with well-intentioned people who was really passionate about being able to make a difference in the lives of people, wanting to help people. And then those agencies, same organizations, get bought up by private equity companies. And the mission of the organization, the stated mission might be the same, but the true motivation and the driver behind the reason the business exists is we want to make as much money as possible, as quickly as possible, so that we can sell at the highest multiple to another buyer, and then we can come in and come out. I think that they have said that there's about 250 transactions that have been done in our field that involve private equity. In the beginning, when private equity were coming in and they were acquiring businesses, they were acquiring these businesses at crazy multiples, 20, 20, 30 times, not earnings, revenues. So now, you know, you have these behavior analysts that created this organization, grew it to a certain point, and they're able to walk away with 10, 20, 30, 50 million dollars. Money is a huge motivator. Yeah. And so these organizations come in and what do they do? They're looking to improve their bottom line. And how they're improving the bottom line is not really focusing on quality outcomes. It's about where can I cut costs? Well, in our field, the costs are in hiring qualified staff and then providing them with the training and then providing with the supervision and the oversight that's necessary so that the behavior technicians can deliver the implementation or implement the programs with fidelity to drive quality outcomes. I have to say, Graham, you know, if you yeah. have an organization whose business model is we're going to come in, consolidate, we're going to get out as quickly as possible with the highest multiple. Mm -hmm. We're not working towards a long haul. Mm -hmm. And even a private equity backed company with a stated mission, we want to come in and we want the field to be able to use the funds that we have to provide services to more people. And some of that yeah. is happening, and that's kind of a positive, but at the risk of losing focus on right. why we're really here. We'll be right back after word from our sponsor. Most of us spend more time at work than anywhere else doing anything else. So why not spend that time in a job you love? Introducing Triad's Jobs Marketplace, the only job site dedicated specifically to behavioral and mental health professionals. Featuring more than 1,000 open jobs from dozens of behavioral and mental health employers and searchable by location, professional field, employment type, specialization, and more. Jobs Marketplace helps you find your next career opportunity. Full-time, part-time, or gig time, make the most of your time. To access Jobs Marketplace, register for your free professional account at hellotriad.com slash BHT. That's hellotriad.com slash BHT. And then click to Jobs Marketplace. If you're already a member of the Triad community, visit app.hellotriad.com slash jobs. That's app hellotriad.com slash jobs. Visit us today and take your next career step tomorrow. Well, with the need being so great at its very best, private equity could be a really great exactly. you know, contributor to this. But you're saying, but not at the expense of the quality 
right. of the outcomes, nor the involvement of improperly trained you know, professionals. And what you've been working to build is what I mentioned at the beginning, the Ethical Standards Board. It's an online database okay. of certified ABAs and registered behavioral technicians that the general public can now use to find qualified technicians and agencies. Tell us a little bit more about what you're doing here in the service of trying to make sure that the quality of care and the people coming into this field are going to be giving the people that are in need what they're seeking the services for. I think one of the biggest problems that the field is experiencing right now is through the BACB, they have the ethics code and mm -hmm. professionals, BCBAs and RBTs, they have to abide by the ethics code, right? And if they don't, then there's a process in place where violations, ethical violations get reported, the board investigates, and you know there's contingencies in place, there's consequences in place. Unfortunately, the BACB can only step in when there is a credential provider, so BCBA or an RBT that's involved. Private equity-backed companies are not owned by BCBAs anymore. Mm -hmm. And so when they're creating havoc in our field and engaging in unethical behavior, there are no contingencies to govern that behavior. So the creation of the Ethics Standards Board of ABA providers is to create a mechanism whereby there are ethical guidelines that agencies have to follow. Quality outcomes is something that we're working towards, and it's a system of accountability and controls. Mm -hmm. And so publishing and disseminating the ethics code that is applicable and organizations themselves must abide by, and a, a method to report violations and for us to investigate that. And Really, what it is, is transparency of information, because I've always felt, and the reason I got into this business was, you know, as long as you provide people with actionable, relevant information, people are very intelligent and they'll mm -hmm. make decisions. So through the ethics board, the ethics standards board, you know, we have an ethics scorecard that we'll be launching and every agency will be requested to complete the ethics scorecard. And obviously people lie, right? Mm -hmm. No, they're going to do whatever it is that they want. So it's not just the agencies themselves that would be completing the scorecard. It'll also be people that work for the organization, so the therapist, and it'll also be parents as well. So then you start to develop a profile around this agency and how they're behaving. You're accumulating more information. And that information then is available to anybody, all of the stakeholders. So it would be parents. It would be RBTs, BCBAs, behavior technicians, people that are, you know, considering, well, do I want to work with this company or not? Right now, really, there is no easy way for a parent to be able to find an agency. They have to go out there and Google, for God's sakes. We don't even have a centralized database of ABA agencies. So first and foremost, that's what the Ethics Standards Board is doing, providing an easy way for people to be able to locate those organizations and then starting to accumulate information so that we're providing actionable information, almost like a 360 degree feedback, if you will. Mm -hmm. right? yes. And we didn't just want, you know, the therapist perspective. We wanted the parents perspective. One thing that the field does not do very well is we don't take parents' concerns and their needs into consideration. So, you know, parents are like the biggest stakeholders. They have the most involved, mm -hmm. you know, in this game, and yet their voices are never heard. And I'm sure that it's probably very, very frustrating for a parent to put the lives of their children in the hands of a bunch of people, you know, professionals, and yet the professionals don't include them in, you know, developing the treatment plan. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't integrate, so we don't do that very well. So what we want to do is we want to hear what the field has to say, but we also want to hear about what parents think as well, because, it, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, when you're talking about outcomes, what matters is, what does a parent think? I think that kind of feedback is terrific. I love this idea of kind of our fields self-monitoring, kind of in that 360 exactly. feedback you're describing and the opportunity through identifying, you know, what are good controls to have in an organization or mm -hmm. standards of care that we would want right. to identify and label and methods for violations being reported or scorecards so that we can exactly. identify quality. This is an opportunity to 
like you're saying, they don't know what they don't know about what they're really even looking for. But to identify and name these organizations as quality, the way you're describing with scorecards, to give them some feedback. And then it sounds like it's also inviting the parents' feedback Yes. So that other parents can have almost like, you know, the reviews to read, to know that what they're going to be bringing their children to is something of benefit, that's right. something that's ethically driven mm -hmm. and kind of morally, you know, in the right place. Mm -hmm. So I really, really like this idea. Where do you see maybe ideally in the next, you know, three, five years, this ethics standard board going? Where'd you like to see it go? There's positive reinforcement and then there's punishment procedures and there's negative reinforcement and so <laughs> unfortunately in our field right now there are a lot of agencies typically larger agencies that are financially motivated so yeah. the transparency of information in terms of the scorecard who's doing a good job who's not doing a great job you know who's behaving ethically who's not behaving unethically that's going to allow people to make decisions about I want to receive services from this agency. I want to go work for this company, or I'm going to avoid them like, you know, they're like, like they're the devil. And yeah. unfortunately, the egregious nature of this continuation of services that's happening right now, and literally clients being fired because of private equity backed businesses are getting into, because they're expanding very, very quickly without doing the necessary analysis. And then they enter the market and decide because of reimbursement, you know, they can't make money or they can't get access to talent. And so they're leaving. But rather than doing it ethically and transitioning for the client who is receiving services to receive services from another organization, they're moving right out without any notification to parents as well. So that information we want to share because we want to be able to say, okay, everybody avoid LME like they're the devil, because mm -hmm. that's exactly what they did. They decided to pull out of a bunch of states because they weren't making money. And rather than providing parents with any chance to transition to another organization, they literally gave them one day notice mm -hmm. and they fired staff and treated them the same. There's nothing ethical about that kind of behavior. We want to bring that information to the mainstream. So people yeah. understand that this is what this organization is doing. So that's one way to do that. So shift and support those organizations that are behaving ethically, that are doing quality work, really outcomes oriented, that have opportunities for RBTs to find a career path, the mentorship, you know, the ongoing training where they can develop the skills and be successful in that organization. But it's only partially solving the problem. What we need to be doing is we need to be establishing standards and providing everybody in the, you know, the industry a way for them to change their business practices. So what we're looking to do is, you know, and I believe, well, if we can establish best practices and some mm -hmm. principles and mm -hmm. where they can make an investment, and that's going to lead to greater staff retention. Mm -hmm better quality outcomes, then that's the better way to go about doing it. So not trying to get people out of the field because that's not helping anybody, but mm -hmm. helping to reform and reshape the behaviors and the business practices and the clinical practices of these organizations by establishing best practices that they can adopt. Then we help elevate the quality of outcomes of everybody that's in the field. So that's where I want to go. Yeah. And what you're really talking about is using the science behind this field to shape the exactly. practitioners and the organizations that are providing the services. So I really like that piece. You know, for those that want to find out more about special learning, about you, about this ethical standards boards, give us some links and some ways for people to learn more about you, maybe even get in contact with you out of interest. Sure. Well, first of all, I'll share my email address. It's kchung at special-learning.com. Special Learning, the website is www.special-learning.com. And the Ethics Standards Board URL is www.esbap.org. And right. so right now, what we have is it's a database of ABA organizations, but we're going to start to do an industry-wide survey so that we can append to that the information that we were talking about, the quality outcome, the scorecard. You know, the scorecard is really important. Our business is very, very complicated. But you can look at a couple different dimensions and figure out whether an organization is making the investment or not making the investment. So looking at turnover, you know, mm -hmm. at the BCBA level, turnover at the RBT level, key indicator, 
and also the amount of investment that they're making in training and education, you know, and also the supervision, what, you know, what percentage of, you know, time are RBTs being supervised? According to the board, minimum amount of supervision that an RBT requires is 5% of the hours that they work. Mm -hmm. Quality organizations know 5% is the bare minimum and they'll offer 15, 10, 15% supervision. So we can tell just by less than 10 questions, tell pretty quickly about the business practices and whether that's adding to, you know, driving quality outcomes or people are not making the investment in the staff and the right. training. And do you know what the, you know, eventual outcome is going to be if you keep sacrificing quality? Yeah, really good. Well, you know, Karen, it's been great to have you on the show and to have you kind of expand upon what this whole field is about, this science in this field. And I love the work you're doing to ensure the quality that you clearly, I mean, you clearly have a heart for this, the the, the, the quality that you want to ensure, the standards you want to put into place, and the accountability that you want to have in a field, which is really what we should be doing in this field, so that those, again, that are seeking these services that are a very vulnerable population, including yes. their parents, right. so much need to have certainty and confidence mm -hmm. in what they're going to be bringing into their home and into the lives of their children. And I love the way that you're kind of shaping some of this using some of the, some of the behavioral analysis techniques, actually using kind of some positive reinforcement to shape good quality care. So thanks for what you're doing. Great to have you on the show today and really appreciate you being with us. Great to see you. Thank you, Peter, for everything, Graham. You know, let's keep talking because there's a lot of different things that we could be doing together. Our field has such great need. It's so sad what we're yeah. doing right now. I would love to do that. It'd be great to be part of the expansion. That's a positive expansion. So right. I would love to have you back on the show and kind of see what continues to grow and how we can be of a support around some of the things you're doing as well. For today, it's been great to have you with us. Thanks again. It's great to see you. All right. All right. Great, great to day. see Bye. you as well. Hey, I also want to thank you, our listeners, for joining Karen and me today. It's always great to have you with us. Regarding our episode today, I want to remind you that it and its resources and all of our other podcasts can be found on our webpage at triadhq.com slash BHT. So go ahead and take a look at our webpage, triadhq.com slash BHT, and explore our archive of podcasts and resource materials. Thanks again for being with us on the show, and we'll look forward to having you back with us next time on Behavior Health Today. We appreciate all the support from our community, and if you like our show, one of the best ways you can support it is by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review. Behavioral Health Today is a podcast part of the Tribe Network, all rights reserved.